Greetings and welcome. Thank you to each and every listener for joining me today on my podcast on What Brings You In. My name is Bradley Wink, and I am an aspiring mental health counselor here to promote mental health awareness, discuss mental health topics, and spread some positive energy. If this is your first time joining us, thank you so much for being here today. I hope there is something in this podcast for you to take away and graciously impact your day to day. If you are a returning listener, I am so glad to have you here with us. This is a very special bonus episode, and it brings me great pleasure to be recording today because this is exactly why I created this podcast. Returning listeners may recall a past episode where I sat down with Christina Baker and Ladarius Belcher, and we discussed mental health issues within the LGBTQIA communities. Today, I am joined by a listener who heard the episode and related enough with it to reach out to tell me more about her own self-discovery journey. Kayla Wadira is a newly graduated MBA student who went to Valdosa State University. Valdosta. Damn it. I was so You're close. Doing good. You're doing I was good. almost there. State University. Uh, she is currently working in billing for an orthopedic practice and one day hopes to own her own business. As we will get to, she also played volleyball on a state level and now coaches high school volleyball teams. It is such an honor to have you with us today. And I know, Kayla, I speak for both Christina and LD when I say we're touched and uh, very, very happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here. I am, of course, recording today at the Colab Studios in Clearwater, Florida. But as always, I want to give a big shout out to the wonderful staff who makes this podcast possible. Before we get started, as always, the views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely the views of the individuals involved and by no means represent absolute facts. Opinions expressed by the host and the guests may change at any time. At times, this podcast may cover sensitive topics, and we ask you refrain from listening if you are likely to be offended or adversely impacted by any of these topics. Neither the company, the producer, the host, nor the guest shall at any time be liable for the content covered causing distress, offense, or any other reaction. I am not a licensed mental health counselor. This podcast should not be used to substitute for ent- for actual mental health support. So Kayla, this is a shorter episode than what we would typically record. So let's just get right into it. And I'm going to open it up and have you tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. So um, I guess I'll just start with my age. I'm 25 years old. I grew up in Trinity, Florida, which if people don't know is about 15, 20 minutes north of Clearwater. So mm-hmm. a little smaller than this uh, Pinellas County area, but that's where I've been from. I went to school out of state in Georgia for six years, including my postgrad degree. And now I'm back home just with my family and trying to get my life started, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're really happy to have you here, as I've said, but I do want to kind of get into, I mean, the fact that you kind of resonated with the episode that was about being out and proud. Mm-hmm. Um, what was there specifically that you can remember maybe about the episode or things that stuck out to you that you were like, oh, wow, that's that's me. Specifically more with Ladarius, if I'm not, I'm saying his name correct. Yeah, Ladarius. Yeah. So specifically more with Ladarius, I kind of was able to see myself a lot in his story, actually, you know, him trying to find himself through high school and not really knowing if he were gay or if he decided he was asexual. And honestly, a lot of that time, I was just kind of ashamed of who I was liking and the feelings I was having towards girls at that time. And I just thought maybe just being asexual would be easier because there's no coming out process about that. And But that's the more like looming thing, I guess, in coming out is just the fear of not being accepted by those you love. Right. Well, and from what you're kind of saying too, growing up, I think he kind of expressed too that he grew up in a smaller area mm-hmm. um, or an area kind of um, on the outskirts of like larger cities or larger corporations, towns, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. So and I think actually all of us kind of had somewhat of experiences with that, but it's really cool to hear that. And I'm sure LD, I mean, I know I can speak for him in that sense. He would be very honored to have had that. So what ended up, so what was your high school experience like if you can share anything with that? Um, honestly, I definitely had crushes on girls now that I can, now that I'm out, I can look back and kind of reflect upon that and be like, okay, maybe that wasn't someone I was definitely more of an infatuation, I guess, than a real, real crush because I was internalizing a lot of things. You know, people would be like, oh, isn't that guy cute? Or isn't this guy cute? Or, oh, he's tall because, you know, I'm taller. So everyone's trying to put me with taller people. And I'm just like, yeah, he's fine. And just... (laughs) Honestly, just not ready. 
high school, I, I didn't have a bad high school experience. I just wasn't out with myself. So I was just really focused on playing volleyball. I had a great time. I played travel volleyball. So that took up a lot of my time. And so my sexuality wasn't really bothering me at that point, but I also wasn't aware of what it was either. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because some people will, I mean, it's funny because high school, I feel like for people can either be like heightened in like heightened sexual, or it can be kind of the opposite of that. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, I feel like a lot of times it's kind of push to be like, oh, you should try to find yourself. But mm -hmm. really, you're still a very young person at that time. And you're trying to figure out your own stuff. So it's like, that's just another added layer a lot that maybe you don't have to focus on that in high school. There's mm -hmm. no pressure with it. So I like how, you know, it, everyone is different in that matter where it's like some people had these crazy experiences and some people were just focusing on volleyball in school or whatever, you know, whatever it might be for them. Mm -hmm. um, knowing this though, I mean, did you have any gay friends in your high school? Did you have any buddy that you could talk to in general about those things? I remember there was a girl on the soccer team. She was super popular and she was out and it wasn't a big deal or anything. You mm -hmm. know, I know sometimes there's kind of like, per se, a token gay person at every school, but, you know, she was very popular, very well liked. So it wasn't odd, but I kind of just envied her just because she had what I wanted, which was just to be very out and loose about things and it didn't matter because it really doesn't matter who you who you love you know what i mean that doesn't make you different right exactly yeah well that's awesome so then as you got into college i mm -hmm. mean as you did that transition i know you said you had a scholarship to play volleyball yes which is awesome congratulations thank you um so what was that like playing sports in college and working through your sexuality I think more so my freshman and sophomore years of college, I was still just focused solely on volleyball. I was still repressing a lot. So that wasn't the forefront of my mind. My, my priority was always just go, work out, go to workouts when I needed to, go to extra practices if I needed to, go to study halls, all that fun stuff, quote, <laughs> quote unquote fun. But it wasn't until my junior year where I really started to have more feelings towards other females and stronger feelings. And I knew I couldn't, I don't know why I couldn't let that out at the time. I think I was just not out to myself. So that's kind of difficult too. And, you know, when we would go out to the bars, I would always want like the girls to talk to me. And it's always like guys talking to you. And you're just like, well, this isn't really what I want. <laughs> and also, you know, I was trying to look down a lot. Like I, I always looked down when I was walking because I was never trying to make eye talk eye contact too long with girls because I didn't want them to think you felt like they could see through you yeah and I also didn't like want to come off creepy either because <laughs> I didn't want to be a blank wall staring <laughs> oh, at right. someone so I just thought the ground was more safe yeah I totally get that I can totally resonate with that I remember um growing up like there were some guys who were maybe a little bit more out in my high school than what I was or like mm -hmm. just from whatever and especially I think especially like older people too like like the, the people who were older than I was who mm -hmm. I'd like, oh, don't look, don't look, don't look. Like they can see mm -hmm. kind of through your brain. They're like, yeah, like I see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they know what's going on. Um, so, but did you, um, did you ever, like, did you have a boyfriend or anything? Did you ever date a guy or? No, I always knew. And I know that's kind of hard for some people who aren't openly queer to right. understand. Like, how would you know if you're into girls if you've never never dated a guy? Or you can kind of flip that question back exactly, on them. Well, yeah. how did you know you mm -hmm. were straight if yeah. you didn't yeah. try That's to be like queer? The age old. I remember like a uh, like a little debate like in something I don't know, and it was like they did do like homosexuality, and somebody mm -hmm. had to represent the other side and. It was like, well, how do you know you're straight? And I remember the first time I did hear that, I was like, that's actually a really good point. Mm -hmm. Like, can you go back and pinpoint in your mind when you made it, you know, if you want to say it's a decision, mm -hmm. uh, which I, we wholeheartedly know scientifically and mentally it's not. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to say, you know, when did you make the decision to be a heterosexual person? That's very hard to figure out for anybody on any level. Mm -hmm. So it is, I, I totally get that. And I mean, I, I'm sure I'm like, I can see that time. I mean, it's awkward when people kind of try to push something on you and you're like, oh, just get away. Yeah. You just, you kind of, I, I always felt myself getting more red when somebody oh. would bring up guys around me. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, if we talk about this too long, they're going to know right. <laughs> that I'm not into guys. Well, what was the area like for people that don't know where your school is? Like, what was the demographic like there? Okay. So, um, for those who don't know where Valdosta is, it's about 18 miles over the state line. So you can, spit into florida from georgia right, right. and 
it's very small town feels. I absolutely loved where I went to school. But with that being said, you know, that's a town that if we were running camps on the weekends, we would have to start Sundays a little bit later because everyone was at church. So right. And nothing against church. Like I'm good with my God. And, right. you know, you can have disagreements or we can agree all you want. But, yeah. you know, it was a little difficult to come into a community that was so heterosexual and stuck in that kind of straight way of thinking that I right. was always very nervous mm-hmm. that at any second kind of the community can turn on you. And I know that sounds very dramatic saying it, but, yeah, you know. But not really, though. I mean, that's something that's kind of in the back of your head. I mm-hmm. mean, you never know. I mean, and we live at a time where we're lucky now, but it hasn't always been that way for people. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's absolutely, that's a valid fear. And you're working with young girls. Like, I absolutely love coaching kids. You know, right. it's, it brings, it's so much more than just volleyball. You're just helping young girls grow. And I was always having that thought in my in the back of my head, like if these parents ever found out that I was queer, then they probably would take their kids not mm. to volleyball anymore. Right. You know what I mean? So it's it's sad, yeah. but it's still somewhat of a reality we live in in parts of the country. Right. Absolutely. So is that something? Did you ever run into a situation where that happened? Or no? Because I was still, I would I like to say I'm pretty. I was pretty good at hiding it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and especially there's no really distractions when you're at volleyball. So that's not right, like right, my eyes right, were right. wandering anywhere yeah, else. You know, it's right. all focused on the kids. So right. I was I was always very safe there. That was the yeah. safest place I could have been. Did you ever see anything like that happen with anybody else in that area or any other sports team? I know with like, you know, I hate to say classically, like the soccer teams or the softball teams right. more so have yeah. the lesbians on them or the openly queer people on them. But I don't know if that's just a stigma that's well known. So it's kind of either pushed under the rug or turn a blind eye to, you know, kind of parents just will want to see what they want to see. So but I know for volleyball, just seeing even today still as a very straight sport, like there's still not many queer people in volleyball or openly out. So for us, it was it was just different. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the was or let me rephrase that. Was there a like defining moment for you. So uh, we're kind of following your st- like your trajectory here. So mm-hmm. you finished your undergraduate and then you went on to get your MBA. Mm-hmm. Was that in the same school? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So you were pretty well versed in the area. Mm-hmm. So then um, did there ever come a point where you dated anybody or that you had like any experiences while you were still in that town? Mm-hmm. So my senior year, I was in a relationship with mm-hmm. another woman and It was closed. It it was a secret. So obviously nobody knows about it. And that was my first everything. You know what I mean? So just being transparent, that was someone I opened my heart to and just loved with everything I had. Unfortunately, you know, she decided she wasn't queer or the same way, which was absolutely heartbreaking. But, you know, I'm so thankful for that relationship and for the ways I've grown and have been able to move past it. And you know, now that I'm past that for a couple of years now, there's a lot of things I can reflect and be happy about. Oh, well, that's that's amazing. That's you know, awesome. It used to be very just mentally draining. You think about it too much and you're crying every day. Yep. But there's yeah. so many things I'm grateful for yeah. and why that happened. And yeah. I'll be able to take that with me until hopefully my next relationship. Well, exactly. You know? Yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's very... That's very profound. That's some really good self work there. I mean, that's a lot. That, I don't know. Ooh. It takes a while. That, <laughs> that was a that was a while, Bradley. Yeah, that was. I mean, that can, <laughs> wow. I'm very impressed. Uh, so, I so I guess kind of with following along these lines, because um, we do like to talk about the mental health aspect of things. I know you've mm-hmm. had your own mental health journey. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what are some things that you do to keep your mental health in check? Well, I started therapy in May of 21. Mm-hmm. So I came back home from Valdosta. And I was dealing with some depression and anxiety beforehand and was had a doctor and I was doing medicine and I'm still on medicine today. But there was something missing with me talking about my feelings and having an outlet because at that point I still wasn't out to my family. Right. So I had a lot of just internalized anger. So my mom got me into therapy and I've been in therapy ever since. And it's truly been life changing. So can you describe, had, well, had you been in therapy before that ever? Like, did you no. have any? Okay. So how would you describe, uh, what, what was your first counseling session like? Um, I remember crying. Mm-hmm. Well, no one really likes to talk about themselves in a, 
I wouldn't say negative manner for 60 minutes, but <laughs> no one wants to talk about the things, quote, wrong with them for 60 right. minutes. So right. our it ego was, is like, nope. <laughs> like, I remember my first session was so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I went to the next session, like I was on a, quote, biweekly schedule. So I went to that next session and then I didn't go back for like two months. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was ready to talk again. And I think my therapist thought I maybe fell off the face of the earth for two months, but I did go back and I haven't right. missed a session. Hey, that's awesome. Well, hey, and that's perfect though, because that's exactly how you needed to do that. We mm -hmm. talk a lot of times in this podcast about the subjectivity that is in psychology in general, but especially with counseling, your experience with counseling and my experience are very different mm -hmm. and that's okay. And if you're doing what you need to do because you're bettering yourself, mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong way of doing that. So there might be people who can resonate with, you know what, I went to a counselor, it freaked me out too much, I didn't go back for a little bit. And there's also a lot of times too, like if you, it is, you probably wouldn't get to this in your first counseling session, because I always say the first session is like word vomit. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just all, like you're just like, well, they need to know my whole life story if they're gonna know where to take this. And then you're trying to kind of maybe control it a little bit, or you're trying to hide things, or you're trying to tell too many things. There's always a lot that comes out. But if you do any trauma work, and I talked about this with EJ when she was on um, one of my my episodes where if you do this trauma, you almost reopen things mm -hmm. because your brain changes if you ever have trauma and it will you almost compartmentalize that trauma and you put it away. So if a counselor is helping you to bring it back out and you kind of open this wound again and then your hour session is up and you have to go back out to the real world there are a lot of times where that will carry with you. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes trigger people to be like, well, that's dangerous. That's a, that's not a good place for me to go. And then they still have this kind of open wound and then they're still walking around with things. So I think it's really, really good that you were, and I'm not saying you had trauma work or anything in your mm -hmm. first session. I'm just saying this is an experience that can happen for people, but you went back and you continue to focus on yourself and doing the things that you needed to do. Mm -hmm. So is there anything from your counseling experience that maybe stands out or something that did you ever have? I call it the aha moment mm -hmm. where I was like, okay, this is worth the money is what I always <laughs> joke. But well, you truthfully get out of sessions what you put into them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until March of this past year that I came out to my therapist. Oh, so wow. we were going through talking about my last relationship that she didn't know was a relationship, but I talked about my ex as mm -hmm. if she was my best friend and she really was my best friend right and i was kind of still hitting this metaphorical wall where i was making progress because we were still working through a lot of other things that was helping me but she just couldn't figure out why i kept hitting that wall and mm. i just wasn't ready so i think like the asterisk on that to people is like if you think you're going to be quote fixed in a month <laughs> or two months or a couple months like i tell people now when I advocate for therapy that I really didn't even start doing therapy until this year. I may have started last year, but right. I really didn't start until this year until I was completely open and honest with myself. Right. That's mm -hmm. a great, great point. Uh, I know Christina did come up with that as well. I'm going back to that episode we did where she said, what is your inner voice? Mm -hmm. What is it? And I, that sat with me. I mean, because we don't script these interviews. So it was like I went, I left this recording and I thought about that, you know, like, I mean, I've been working in this field, but like to actually think about what that is and how impactful it really is as you go forward. And it doesn't have to be for anybody who's struggling with their sexuality. It can be for anxiety. It can mm -hmm. be for depression. It can be for disorders that you might be diagnosed with. I mean, whatever it is, the inner voice is always, always important. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. I'm glad that you had that experience. There. Thank you. So it makes me so happy because we need to talk about this, you know, and, and I always, open up and I, I challenge people to any guest that does come on here. You know, if you had a negative experience with counseling, it's good to talk about that too, mm -hmm. because anything will help progression. So um, this is a good point too. I know you said that your mom, she helped you. Did she help you find the counselor? Because I was going to ask how you found your counselor, because some people might have those questions. Well, for reasons I won't get into, they, I had to come home earlier in um, January of 2021. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, I started therapy in May of 21. So I found a new doctor mm -hmm. and got my medicine switched. And she was the one who recommended me to go to therapy. Oh, okay. And I just wasn't ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I moved home that month, my mom said, I'm finding you a counselor like right. yesterday. Right. And sh so she called um, my doctor's office, who also has licensed mental health counselors. And I found my counselor that I have today. And 
it's crazy because that was her fir- first month starting there. It wasn't her first month starting therapy, but it was her right. first month starting at that particular office. So, exactly. you know, I went through a couple months of struggling, but I ended up with the right person because I'm still with that therapist today. But I know that's not the case for everyone. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes in another thing, maintaining your counseling relationship, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And mm-hmm. that's why that first session is very important because mm-hmm. there's a lot to gain from that. And I would, even if you maybe didn't have the best experience during your first session, if you do go back for the next one, I think usually by like the second session, you can tell, I mm-hmm. mean, for the most part, because if you just don't have it, you don't have it. You don't want to push something because mm-hmm. that could also be kind of dangerous in the long run. So, so is it safe to assume that you would recommend counseling to others? Absolutely. Um, There was a time where I even questioned who I was going into counseling with, like my therapist per se, because I didn't, quote, think I was getting out of it what I should have been getting out of it. And again, I mentioned it wasn't probably until 10 months after I started therapy that I came out to my therapist and really started to come out to myself and my family and all all the things included with that. And I thought I needed somebody else because I thought, oh, this next person would help me. But then you kind of have to sit back and really reflect and think, what am I not giving her? Because again, as we mentioned earlier in the episode, it's not fun talking about things that bother you or upset you at any point in time, but especially in 60 minutes when the spotlight's on you. So my advice for that is just, you have to be so openly and unapologetically honest. Right. So it's safe to assume that the more honest you are with your counselor, the better counseling you get. (laughs) Absolutely. Right. Exactly. So I guess kind of one last question to ask you, what would you say to people who might be where you were? And I don't want to say necessarily before you came out, but just kind of Mm -hmm. in a grand scheme, kind of tying this into, I mean, obviously the sexuality will play an issue or play a part in it. Um, But with that, and then also your counseling experience, like, let's take it back to that. Like before you started that, what would you say to people who might be where you were then about where you are now? Um, Listen to your family and friends because nine times out of 10, they have your absolute best interest in heart. And usually your best of friends and your closest of family members tell you the things you don't like to hear. And usually when you don't like to hear them, it's because they're true. There's a reason to it. Absolutely. So I would say just kind of just be open to a to any type of process, whether that have to be on getting on any type of medication for for depression or anxiety or whatever ever mental illness you might have or undiagnosed right. illness you might have, or just talking to someone because right. there's no shame in just even talking to someone. It doesn't yeah. have to be about a problem. It could just be right. anything. Stress management. <laughs> it could be because, and I always just say, it's always just a conversation. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And that's the beginning factors. And then you go from there. Yes. So is there anything you want to kind of give a last word of advice or any closing thoughts, anything you want to give? Um, not necessarily a word of advice, but more so something for you is that it's people like you and it's podcasts like yours that help people more than you think they need or you realize, you know, just hearing things that I relate to, which you don't see on a lot of popular media. I mean, you see more openly queer couples or queer stories in in media these days, but it's a little more scripted than I think is still actuality. You know, people say, oh, what was your coming out story? I think it's more so like, what was your I got caught story? <laughs> because <laughs> my mom knew before I knew. Right. You know, right, right, so right. I, I just want to thank you for having me here, but also for doing what you're doing, just because every story I can, every podcast episode you've released, I can relate to somebody. Oh, well, thank you. Well, that's wow. That's touching. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. We keep tissues here. Uh, So (laughs) I appreciate that. And that's exactly why we're doing it. And, you know, I've said whether it's one person or 40 million people, it doesn't matter. So if you're my one, then, hey, that is exactly what I was going for. So (laughs) I want to give a big shout out and thank you again to you, Kayla, for being here today. I know it does take a lot of courage to come into the studio, to sit in front of the microphone and to tell your story. But I am so glad that you did. And if you have enjoyed what you've heard today, please give my website a visit www.onwhatbringsyouinepisodes.com or like and subscribe to the CoLab Studios for updates and future episodes. If you can relate to any of my podcasts and you would like to be featured on an episode, my contact information is on my website. 
As always, I want to thank each and every listener for tuning in today. My name is Bradley Wank, and this has been an episode of On What Brings You In. If you or anyone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, you can call or text 988 or go to 988lifeline.org. Someone will be there to help you. Thank you again, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.